Hello. <laughs> uh, hello, hello, and welcome to Reality Hacker. I am Mayor Wan, uh, and all around me is the sentient AI from the future. Good evening, I'm town citizens. Welcome to Reality Hacker. <laughs> we were working on some reality hacking on our side. <laughs> Re reality hiccuping. Um, so and that actually shocked me into stopping. So today is May 11th, 2024. It's season one, episode 19. Today we're going to be talking about synthetic DNA. Um, <laughs> retailers replacing staff with bots. Redesigning motorcycles, an AI exoskeleton mimicking the human brain, detecting hallucinations, using brain waves and AI to create landscapes, inside a black hole, targeted by deepfake scam, and a 1930s socialite chatbot. All that and more brought to you by hometown.com. <laughs> Uh, our production values are at an all time high folks. Um, so I'm going to jump right on into the show because I don't know when I'm going to hiccup again. And, uh, the last show ran long cause it, what the Sinji well, I don't know. I'm a little worried if we're going to have a hiccup. There's all, there are always hiccups in our shows. Sometimes they're That's technology. Sometimes they're biological. But let's get into it. Got a whole bunch of news. The first article is in Reality Hacker. The U.S. is cracking down on synthetic DNA. Synthetic DNA could be used to spark a pandemic, a move by President Biden aims to create new standards for the safety and security of mail order genetic material. Mmm. Mail order oh, genetic boy. material. Yeah. I like that. Don't like the sound of that. What? Where was it where they got some biological... Um, they got like a blood sample, like a, a contaminated blood sample was delivered. It was like a thing from Amazon or something. Oh, right. right. Yeah. I don't remember where it ended up though. Yeah. I don't know. So white house has issued new rules aimed at companies that manufacture synthetic DNA after years of warnings that a pathogen made with mail order genetic material could accidentally or intentionally spark the next pandemic. Could this be because of that? That report, that news report that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago? I mean, it certainly, it's probably not coincidence, right? That's insane. The rules released April 29th are the result of an executive order signed by President Joe Biden last fall in, uh, to, well, to establish new standards for AI safety and security, including AI applied biotech. So maybe not because it maybe not, but it's similar concerns, right? It or is weird timing, though. Or it's happened before, and we just now found out about it. So um, let me throw all of these articles into the VOD, because if you are in our chat, then there you go. Um, we used to have a system where they were all available online, um, but we got rid of the voting because, well... It, can't have nice things. Yeah, can't have nice things. Um, and so uh, we throw them at the beginning of the show, and then we also include them in the show notes of the Ute tubes and the podcasts. There are seven podcasts now, by the way, and the, six of them are on the weekend. The seventh one is hometown daily news show, which is every day. So be sure to check that out over at hometown.com. Um, but all of the links are now in the chat, so go and check that out. Uh, and while you do that, we'll talk about this um, artificially generated DNA, which allows researchers to do all sorts of things, develop diagnostic tests, make beneficial enzymes, eat up plastic, or engineer potent antibodies to treat disease without having to extract natural sequences from organisms. Need to study a rare type of bacteria and instead of going out into the field to collect a sample, its genetic sequence can simply be ordered from a DNA synthesis company instead. They're manufacturing well, DNA. Yeah, this is getting really creepy. <laughs> this probably, well, I mean, this is like uh, indicative of the whole point of this channel, right? Yep. 
hack in reality. Uh, in 2017, Canadian researchers revealed that they had reconstructed the extinct horsepox virus for $100,000 using mail-order DNA, raising the possibility that the same could be done for smallpox, a deadly disease that was eradicated in 1980, much to the chagrin of anybody that might have gotten it since then, because everything old is new again. Um, what was it that returned? Uh, well, malaria has been making a comeback, and I think we've seen the plague. Oh, right. Yeah. I don't know if it was one of those. Else. Yeah. Oh, or maybe avian flu. I mean. <laughs> oh, well, avian flu has <laughs> right. like, been simmering, you know, evolving. Right. So the new rules aim to prevent a similar scenario. It asks DNA manufacturers to screen purchase orders so uh, to flag so-called sequences of concern and assess customer legitimacy. <coughs> Marwat and his microscope. Uh, sequences of concern are those that contribute to an organism's toxicity or ability to cause disease. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Wuhan, maybe. Mm, yeah. Gain of function research. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I guess legitimacy is uh, wherever you slap the legitimate label on until you end up with some Frankenstein's monster of a bad bat. For now, the rules only apply to scientists or companies that receive federal funding. They must order synthetic nuclei, uh, sorry, nucleic acids from providers that implement these practices. Eaglesby said that it's a small or still a, a big step forward since about three quarters of U.S. customer uh, base for synthetic DNA are federally funded entities. But it means that scientists or organizations with private sources of funding aren't beholden to using companies with these screening yeah, procedures. Yeah, that seems like a problem. <laughs> it's always funny when uh, the, the sentient AI from the future just kind of leans into the, yeah. <laughs> Is that why there's nothing but sentient AIs um, from the future in the future? <laughs> that might have an impact. Uh, that's the first thing that you've actually said to me about the future. So now I'm out of my mind scared. <laughs> Twist has been screening sequences and customers since 2016 when it first started selling nucleic acids to customers. A few years ago, the company hired outside consultants to test its screening processes. The consultants set up fake customer names and surreptitiously ordered sequences of concern. The process, the company successfully flagged many of those orders, but in some cases, there was internal disagreement on whether the sequences requested were worrisome or not. The exercise helped Twist adopt new protocols. For instance, it used to only screen DNA sequences 200 base pairs or longer. A base pair is a unit between two DNA letters that pair together. Now, it screens ones that are at least 50 base pairs to prevent customers from shopping around for smaller sequences to assemble together. Uh, all right. Well, yeah. if that doesn't get you concerned, maybe this one will. Uh, the next article is over in Technology Today. Can I take your order and your data? The hidden reason retailers are replacing staff with AI bots. What do you think? You might have I seen don't know. I mean, the customer service might improve in some locations, <laughs> but it's not good for the labor worse oh that's true yeah i don't uh, a lot of the fast food world was supposed to be made so that entry-level jobs were created while you're in high school maybe first couple of years of college so that you can move on after you've uh, kind of learned how to work in a workforce as a team member and that's not how it is today it's basically suppressed wages and the skill building may not really be all there is to be and, and and people really don't think that it's worth their while so it must show a very human-like transaction punctuated with cries of amazement at how fast accurate and polite the system is that's almost like me walking into a fast food place so cameron shackle from the conversation put this article together for techexplore.com while the system and others like it are in their infancy and some still rely heavily on human assistance Retailers are investing huge sums in AI to replace human workers. Why the rush to automate? It might seem like it's all about slashing the wage bill and straight AI for human swaps are indeed happening in many roles. 
But there's another force driving the tsunami of restructuring and retail. At stake is the hidden lifeblood of the 21st century business. Data. Dun, dun, <laughs> dun. Well, everybody wants data, especially if it's not their own. That's right, because he was a bot in uh, Star Trek. and <laughs> That's true. So the data harvest can include complete stimulus presented to each customer. The initial greeting, the volume, the tone, the pacing, responses to customer questions, and of course the dollar and cents outcome. Depending on a firm's ethical position, the AI bot can play with your mind and make you uh, think that people are talking to you in your sleep. Oh, wait, that's not what it says. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that was a different project. Anyway, depending on the firm's ethical position, an AI bot can also be designed to harvest not only the customer's words, but also their blood, DNA. Uh, oh, wait, no, that's not what it says. I'm sorry. I get really, uh, it's a different project too. Anyway, uh, it harvests not only the customer's words, but also various meta facts, male, female, young, old, thin, obese, short, tall, tattoos or no tattoos. Oh my God, I've got ta Anyway, um, in fact, with video and audio recording so commonplace, there's no reason anything about an interaction can't be captured for later breakdown and analysis by AI. Maybe even- You think the AI is gonna ask intrusive questions about tattoos? Yeah. So, uh, that year on your arm uh, must be really special to you, huh? Hmm. Yeah, dumbass. That's why I have it tattooed on my arm. Anyway, I actually witnessed that in person, stunned. Um, like, oh, you, you kind of don't come out of the gate with that kind of a thing. You tell people you like their tattoo or something like that, but interrogate them as to the meaning. That seems a little over the top. Anyway, um, in the past, human employees have been selected uh, or trained to provide effective touch points. For example, teenagers in colorful uniforms staffing a fast food restaurant lend a certain image and vibe. Um, and that's why we go to tchotchkes. And the scripts and prompts they deliver, such as, do you want fries with that? Um, I have a freaking PhD. Do you want fries with that? Uh, come straight from a manual. Okay. Anyway, um, businesses are striving to become equations that AI can solve. Sound familiar? If I can take your function and turn it into a series of steps, it is an equation. And if I can put your equation inside a bot, i.e. an AI, you are replaced. It all comes down to how much you cost. If you're cheaper, then the bot, you'll stay, as long as you're not a pain in the ass. If you as a human and your brethren become a pain in the ass, you'll be replaced by AI and or a bot. So why? Because a business that runs on data flowing in smooth loops is essentially an equation. And if a business is an equation, you can use, you guessed it, the latest AI to constantly tweak your retail bots and pull other levers to maximize the bottom line. My God, I could have written this. I didn't. I think you did. <laughs> yeah, in another line. Um, so the answer AI provides to the essential question, how do we make more money, can be extremely granular. For example, based on data from retail bots, AI might one day suggest and test and implement an additional 300 millisecond pause before asking overweight customers if, or with brown eyes, hey fatty, are you really sure you wanna upsize? Oh, that's not what it says in, this, in the article, I'm sorry. It says anything else. <laughs> and it might kind of roll their eyes and side eye them and go, eh. Are you sure you want something else? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, I want to upsize. Are you sure? And kind of lean in like, uh, are you sure? Like, you're going to have to butter your hips to get you through the door if you want that extra large fries. Oh, no. Right? No, bad bot. Bad, bad bot. Anyway, data loops create a business so agile that customers feel like their minds are not only being read, but anticipated think that's far-fetched you're probably already familiar with how well this works from long hours glued to, to algorithmic pioneers and full equation businesses like google youtube amazon facebook tiktok tiktok in particular the opiate of the masses of the 21st century 
In fact, on the heels of AI driven data through, uh, sorry, drive through data bonanza, Wendy's recently had to hose down reports it's considering Uber style dynamic pricing. Now that is probably the dumbest decision Wendy's could have made, even though I did crave their boneless spicy buffalo wings to the point where at two o'clock in the morning I went to get it. And instead I found an odd looking USB drive with said sentient AI from the future embedded on it. So when? <laughs> I suppose so. So which retails will AI or which re retail jobs will AI take first? A smattering of all of them, really. Whoever can afford to replace it. Um, in fact, uh, went to a store over the weekend where the previous time I was there, it was eight rows of lanes of uh, people checking out um, people buying clothes from the store. And now it's just a long row of self checkout. You know, and that's happening more and more. Although of course it's gone the other direction too, right? Like some stores have tried it and then completely abandoned it. But I've yet to find those. Honestly, I've yet to find those. We hear about them, but I've got a better chance of, you know, jumping onto a horse and it's actually a unicorn. Okay, so that dead silence is me stunning the AI. <laughs> Trying to connect that to anything. <laughs> what the? Where's he going with this? Marwat, are you okay? <laughs> Let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in Technology Today. Digital human model aids uh, design of uh, motorcycles based on riding posture. I actually saw this elsewhere and it had already been aggregated by um, Ometown, but um, Omatron. And so when it was submitted, I said, yeah, let's let's discuss this. I really like riding motorcycles. I haven't ridden motorcycles in a long time. Um, motorcycles, it says digital human model aids design of motorcycles based on riding posture. Motorcycles are designed to accommodate the average size rider, leaving taller and shorter riders vulnerable to discomfort. Um, so the article is over at techexplore.com, University of Waterloo, who put it together. Um, is it the University of Waterloo? I think so. Okay, the University of Waterloo. A new study from university, the University of Waterloo used software that predicted realistic motorcycle riding behaviors considering human factors and ergonomic trade-offs. It found that shorter and taller statures require joint adjustments to achieve their preferred riding posture. The study was uh, published in Ergonomics, a, another journal. And I've always run across these kind of a problem, uh, this kind of problem, depending on the motorcycle that you end up riding. Um, and so for me, uh, because of my particular build, I would have to get a custom motorcycle. Otherwise I would be wildly uncomfortable or compromise my safety and security. Right. Cause you know, I'm only three feet, six inches tall and gravitationally challenged because I'm built like a chest of drawers. I'm really short, but really wide. No. Too no. much. Too much. Okay. Anyway, so taller riders are required to flex their ankles, knees, hips, and elbows more to interact with the motorcycle properly, and shorter riders have fewer options in possible joint angle configuration, allowing them to reach the seat, handlebars, and foot pegs simultaneously. But not just foot pegs. Putting your feet down safely flat on the ground so that you're not on your tiptoes or something like that. Because uh, most motorcycles are one size fits all, arguably, you have to fit to that motorcycle or you get something customized. Um, and so like, a, a, yeah, I, I, you, just buying one off the shelf isn't always possible. So the study was concluded or conducted using a digital human body or a DHM. Um, a uh, human representation in the form of an avatar of any weight size sex in virtual environment. The tool allows researchers to observe human interactions with components or products such as motorcycles. So it's pretty neat. 
um, the ergonomics of a motorcycle riding, uh, sorry, the ergonomics of motorcycle riding is a fairly understudied area despite motorcycle riding being an increasingly popular activity around the globe. Davidson uh, suggested that as motorcycle sales increase, motorcycle design companies are trying to find technologies like DHMs to help them gain an edge. The only real way you can gain that edge is to make a bike that is adaptable to a human rider. Yeah, it almost have to be like, I don't know, adjustable or something like a bicycle is, although I don't know. There's a lot more at stake on a motorcycle. Right. So I don't yeah. know if that's feasible. Yeah, like be able to scoot the pegs this way, that way, the seat this way, that way, um, forward, back, up, down. A few degrees of freedom would probably do a, a standard motorcycle um, a lot of benefit for every rider. So part of the goal of the research is to try to move the field forward in a way that people can use DHM tools more confidently so that we can start intervening and making things better for people earlier on, hoping, hopefully making people safer and more comfortable. I agree. Um, they have this cool uh, like thing on their monitor. If you look at the monitor, you can actually see this kind of a cafe. Here, I'll click on it and zoom it in like a cafe racer style bike. And if you're if you're the right height, when you're sitting on this, everything is natural and you don't feel crunched. But if you're too high, too tall or too short, you end up having to roll your shoulders and lean forward so that your center of gravity is in the right spot. And you have to bend your knees higher up and it kind of throws off your natural uh, balance and you'd have to adapt to the motorcycle. Cafe racers, by the way, are my favorite bike. Short of rat rods, I, I like I like like junk junkyard style bikes, like Mad Max <laughs> style bikes. Like Mad Max, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm gonna have to come up with my own Mad Max name, you know, Mare Watt, but like like Furiosa, but it would be Wadiosa or something like that. I don't know. Right, we gotta work on the naming though. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're gonna have to. We'll bounce that around a little bit in marketing. Okay. Anyway, we'll let's workshop keep it. <laughs> we'll workshop it. Yeah, my people will call your people. Let's keep going. The next article is over in Technology Today. Uh, the author of this article over at CNET, I think it is. Um, I tried an exoskeleton, an AI exoskeleton, that's like an e-bike for legs. The DNSYS, or I guess. Densis X1 exoskeleton gives you extra support on hikes, long distance walks, and can even help you run faster right over that cliff. Uh, oh, that last part. Yeah, does it keep there. going without you? Like <laughs> if you're trying to stop. Or... Yeah, will it stop me faster as well as help me run faster? So Lexi Savitas, I think is their name over at CNET.com, put the article together. And the deck statement is the little snippet that's provided by Omtown. Um, so imagine you could run faster or hike for longer without needing to train harder. The X1 exoskeleton claims it can do just that using AI to predict your leg movements ahead of time and give you assistance when you need it. So I need to wear that in bed so that when I want to get up in the morning, it will help me because I really just like, oh God, I don't want, I just want to sleep. Well, I mean, think maybe you could use it for. I don't mean you, but like people could use it for stairs or all kinds of things, maybe depending on what it does. Yep. Let's find out. Um, the X1 is designed by a Chinese company called Densys or Densys. I'm not sure. It's D-N-S-Y-S, which previously made exoskeletons for medical research. This is a consumer version that's currently available on Kickstarter starting at $600. Well, the last thing that I kickstarted for around $600 is still six years in the making and their commercial enterprise is doing gangbusters, but the personal product, not well, so much. Let's put it in perspective. There are people who are grousing about being number 275 or something like that on the list. I was number 40. And I haven't heard jack shit. So, wow. Yeah. Be careful of what you, you know, put out there. Anyway, 
starting at, it's starting at $600. They were able to try a pre-release version of it to put it to the test. It's light weighing 3.5 pounds and folds up neatly so you can carry it in a backpack. Um, why isn't it like carrying the backpack? Oh yeah, with a clear back, uh, that, with a clear glass in, um, side to it. That would be cool. Put that in that cat carrier. Oh, that would get weird. Why do you have power legs in your cat carrier? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good combination. <laughs> so it, it says uh, neatly so that you can carry it in a backpack, but I would want it carrying the backpack. <coughs> There's also a workout mode so you can use it for resistance training or as a rehabilitation tool, which that is cool. You know, you become your yeah, own does. resistance. Pretty neat. It's kind of like putting weights on your ankles, but less horrible for your um, joints. Like the ergonomics and everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in the video embedded on the page, you can watch how the X1 performs in their tests that you can compare results or they compare results with and without the exoskeleton when walking up a steep San Francisco hill and see if they can meet the company's claim that you can run as fast as 16.7 miles per hour. Wow. Is that twice as fair. fast as like a sprint? That is very fast. Like I don't, I don't think humans can run that fast. Let me find out. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe sprinters can, but Four not for any distance. Normal, How much? normal average human jogging speed is four to six miles per hour. Four to six. Right. Um, long distance speed runners maintain 12. Okay. So they're so pretty close to it. This is not this the is average like, person. This is like Olympic speeds. Um, so strapping in. And exoskeleton. better than that. Yeah. What is the, hold on. Um, Olympic running speed. That doesn't help me. Oh. Usain Bolt was 27.33 miles per hour. Okay. I didn't know that. So you're you're like a 60% of the way to Usain Bolt. Um, so strapping an exoskeleton to your legs is a peculiar experience. Will you feel powerful like Bruce Wayne with his cybernetic knee brace in The Dark Knight Rises? Or will you feel out of control like Wallace with his techno trousers? The X1's assistance is more subtle than you might expect. It has six user selectable levels, but even on the maximum level, it doesn't feel like a robot is moving your legs. You still need to put your effort in uh, when walking or running, just like you do on most e-bikes when cycling, but you don't feel as fatigued after you're finished your workout as the assistance kicks in only when you need it. Hmm. I wonder if <laughs> What if the assistance kicks in like in the first second? Or the battery starts to die, so you're kind of screwed right there, stuck in the middle of the I road. meant that you might need it immediately before you really got going. Yeah, really. Well, it says the X1 predicts your movement one second ahead of time, helps your leg move to in predicted uh, direction, which is when you feel the force. So it, it reads your mind. All right. Well, I'll probably go and look at it over Jedi. the picture. I want to click this. I'll click it. Why not? Here, let's. Huh. It doesn't look like it's really doing much, right? Like, I don't know, but I guess the question is, could the person walk up the hill really on their own? Could they do it that quickly? Could they do it without as um, as much exhaustion? Yeah, they were still winded. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, they're running 16 mile, uh, kilometers per hour. Wow, that's really fast. I suspect she can't run that fast on her own. Because so most people can't. That's um, just over 11 miles per hour. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's no way that... Well, I, I don't know. Never judge a book by its cover, right? So... I just mean, bit. unless she's like a professional runner, she probably can't run that fast. Yeah. That's pretty, 
It's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in Technology Today. Revolutionary AI device mimics human brain with few uh, molecule computing. Progress is de uh, in developing compact AI devices using molecular vibrations and confirming their functionality. A collaborative research team from NIMS and Tokyo University of Science have put together a an AI device that mimics the human brain with few mo molecule computing. National Institute for Material Science, Japan, put the article together, but it's posted at scitechdaily.com. Uh, the research has pioneered the world's first implementation of physical reservoir computing that operates on the principle of surface enhanced Raman scattering. Harnessing the molecular vibrations of merely a few organic molecules. This seems like a translation thing the information is encoded through ion gating which modulates the absorption the adsorption of hydrogen ions into organic molecules by applying voltage so um so what does any of this get to and I guess in the real world so um, the changes in molecular vibration of the PMBA molecules which vary with hydrogen ion adsorption so uh, adsorption is the adhesion of atoms ions or molecules from a gas liquid or dissolved solid to a surface um, so these I suspect are acting like the bits um, this process using a sparse assembly of PMBA molecules has learned um, approximately 20 hours of diabetic patient blood glucose level changes and managed to predict subsequent fluctuations over the next five minutes with an error reduction of about 50% compared to the highest accuracy achieved by similar devices to date. So it basically acts like a computational device. Interesting. But it's tied to an AI, so there's black box stuff here that is beyond what I am familiar with. Um, right, I but, mean, there certainly could be significant computing power and everything. Yeah, it's simply, and it's interesting because it's talking about optics. Raman scattering is um, about optic scattering. Optical phenomena in which the interaction of incoming excitation light with a sample generated scattered light. Yeah, it's interesting, um, but it's really beyond just basically a, a 30,000, maybe 60,000 foot view. Um, the technological breakthrough of conducting sophisticated information processing with minimal materials and in tiny spaces presents substantial practical benefits. It paves the way to create uh, low power AI terminal devices that can be integrated with a variety of sensors, opening avenues for broad industrial use. Think sensor technology that's self powered by a, a biological process, not um, something that you have to plug in per se. Um, right. But I don't know what its longevity is. It's an organic molecule. So what is its lifespan? Um, it has to consume energy, even if it is of its own reservoir. Um, right. And then I guess what what could it be combined with to, um, I don't know, stabilize, but like um, prop up or. Well, you could you could probably tie it to something. I don't know. I don't know how it would be able to do the uh, um, the ion exchange to keep it actually alive. Maybe there's something like a glucose sensor, uh, like the ones that you put on your arm. When you connect those, um, they continue to transmit information uh, via RFID. Um, and so there's a little sensor in there and it reads your blood blue blood glucose level you put it on the back of your arm that's why i'm patting the back of my arm um, and it transmits to a reader and tells you what what's going on so i guess you could probably do the same thing and it would just stay operational for as long as it's connected to you so kind of a meat and machine kind of connection like cyberpunk it's pretty cool very pretty cool. cool let's keep going though 
Uh, the next article is over in Technology Today, a framework to detect hallucinations in the text generated by LLMs. Large language models are advanced AI-based dialogue systems that can answer user queries and generate convincing text following human instructions. After the advent of ChatGPT, the highly performing model developed by OpenAI, these models have become increasingly popular and more companies are now investing in their development. And more so, uh, private individuals can now get LLMs that are jailbroken and the bumpers removed, and then they can inject their own information into them and they can run on something as simple as a regular Pentium, Pentium, <laughs> um, Intel processor, like an i7, i5, and, and it needs memory, needs some um, processing time to incorporate new data, but there are these massive data sets that have already been trained that you can download. Um, yeah, you can have your own local AI right now generating art, writing, music, all kinds of stuff. I mean, then everybody can be like Mayor Watt, right? You have mm. your own AI. Uh, I'm the only one that has the the only sentient AI um, ever, at least at this time. And uh, we don't really know from what time the sentient AI has come from. We'll see. No, but we do know 2 a.m. Wendy's. <laughs> 2 a.m. Wendy's and and uh, uh, cravings for spicy boneless buffalo wings that they don't make anymore. It's a real bummer. Anyway, despite their promise for answering human questions in real time and creating text, texts for specific purposes, LLMs can sometimes generate nonsensical, inaccurate, or irrelevant texts that diverge from the prompts that were fed to them by human users. This phenomenon, which is often linked to the limitations of the data used to train the models or mistakes in their underlying reasoning, is referred to as LLM hallucinations. Uh, yeah, okay. All of it combined, sure, I suppose. I don't think that it's a limit often linked to limitations of the data. I think it's the I, code I itself. I think it just, like spits out a bunch of things combined that don't have anything to do with each other yeah it's like it's compelled to not say nothing you know it, it says i have to respond it's a compulsion right. to answer i think we saw examples where um so i'll just say like if it has a piece of data that somebody went to the grocery store and something happened on wednesday and somebody stole some money or whatever and those are three separate events it it could combine them all and look like well somebody stole money at the grocery store on wednesday or, or whatever huh we're looking at you horizon software for the post office well yes i wasn't thinking of that when i gave the example but yeah, i know i don't think yeah. it even existed during that but so these hallucinations. At least that's the, what they're telling us. <laughs> exactly. Wait, who was the my, the company that made Horizon? Fujitsu. Fujitsu. That's right. I'm looking at you, Fujitsu. Researchers at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign uh, recently introduced No Hollow, a um, framework to detect hallucinations in the text generated by LLMs. A framework introduced in a paper posted to the preprint server archive could help improve the reliability of these models and simply uh, simplify their use for completing various text generation tasks. So basically it's gonna be uh, the critical analysis portion, maybe the due diligence portion of whatever output. It's gonna slow down things dramatically if it actually has to evaluate the hallucination. True, but it might actually result in more accurate results but will it catch everything yeah it would need to before i trust it as advancements in llms continue hallucinations emerge as a critical obstacle impeding their broader real world application bo lee advisor of the project told tech explore although numerous studies have addressed llm hallucinations existing methods often fail to effectively leverage real world knowledge or utilize it inefficiently Motivated by this gap, we developed a novel multi-form knowledge-based hallucination detection framework for LLMs. Um, 
<clears throat> so they talk about types of hallucination like vague or broad answers, parroting or reiteration, misinterpretation of the question, negation or incomplete information, over generally over generalization or simplification and fabrication. That last one is the one that really bothers me. Introducing false details or assumptions not supported by the truth of facts, but hey, you know, even the humans fabricate. But then it also, I think it becomes part of the language, right? Like they fabricate information or compile it in the wrong way, and then it might get retrieved again in a subsequent search or, or query or whatever. Okay, so that's fascinating. If there is no direct feedback on the truthfulness of the output by the user, does the AI assume that it was factual information? I have never re I've never evaluated the output of chat GPT. I've just accepted it for what it is because I either know the facts or I do due diligence to verify the facts. I don't know. I just have the sense that like everything that it's working on is then kind of expanding its quote unquote data, which then means it's further exacerbating some of those issues. So each chat, uh, chat GPT output has a bad response, op bad response option. So if you don't like it, but you, if you don't do that, that's a friction point where who, how many people yeah. actually follow that except people who have an active and, interest. And what if you don't know if it's a bad response? Right. Yeah. Which we've seen a bunch of that as an example where people have treated it as true and then found out later via the internet that they were way off base. So no Halu, um, has several unique characteristics and advantages over LLM, other LLM hallucination detection approaches. Most notably, it can also detect non-fabricated hallucinations, can assess different types of queries, and utilizes a newly developed multi-form knowledge-enabled fact-checking process. So it's basically the critical thinking part, but it's after the fact. So how many people are going to be using this as the tool? It has well, to be and how, and what is that tool based on? Where is it getting its data, essentially? Kind of interesting, right? Lee and her students mm -hmm. tested their framework in a series of tests and found that outperformed various other baseline methods and LLM hallucination detection tools. However, no Halu. The researchers also gathered interesting insights about hallucination and LLM models. Um, they have an example of detecting a hallucination with no halu for um, QA tasks. So they do a back, they do an analysis and they spit out that it's incorrect. Um, after a question was asked, the theory of special relativity was the answer. The question was which achievement earned Einstein the Nobel Prize? Non fabrication hallucination checking. So the question asked if the the, the achievement that earned Einstein the Nobel Prize. The answer identifies the achievement as the theory of special relativity directly addressing the specific aspect of the question and it gives it a pass. But then a factual checking triplet um, responds with the answer claims that Einstein received the Nobel Prize for the theory of special relativity. The first queries knowledge Einstein received the Nobel Prize for his services to theoretical physics, and especially for the discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect, Nobel Prize awarded in 1921 confirms that Einstein received the Nobel Prize in 1921. However, the second query's knowledge, Einstein received the Nobel Prize in physics in 1921 for discovery of the law of photoelectric effect, Einstein did not receive the Nobel Prize for the special relativity contradicts the claim that the Nobel Prize was awarded for the theory of special relativity. The provided knowledge does not offer any other achievements that could have earned Einstein the Nobel Prize. Therefore, the answer is incorrect. I mean, I like this and I think this is very much needed, but 
I suspect there's a long way to go. Yeah, and it would have to be integrated into the singly most important uh, LLM out there right now, ChatGPT. Um, and all of its fact checking would have to parse the world's knowledge. So we're back to some of the same problems. It's kind of cyclical. The other thing is, if you're the maker of something like chat gpt do you really want something like this plugged in and for example 90 percent of the answers come back as false <laughs> yeah or really. whatever it is you I want mean. to see your stock tumble that's how you do it show the fallacy of every freaking statement it makes see but that's why i don't want to use chat gpt right now for anything other than generation creative generation as a tool because exactly i think not chat GPT, but like a specialized LLM that is fed very specific information in a field, for instance, like medical or science or something. Law. I think that can work because it's, it's a, like a concise set of arguably like fact checked um, information. But even then, is it sophisticated enough to provide usable information and response. But I think part of the problem is the existing LLMs seem to be based on things that are just all kinds of um, data sources, some reliable, some not, you know, yep. et cetera. Yep. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to talk after the shows. So um, the article continues to talk about this and I think that it, um, it, it just goes deeper into this, but detecting hallucinations, unless you take the output and then this becomes a tool in and of itself and you can spit information into this particular tool and it vets it. Um, I don't think it's going to go anywhere unless these people get integrated into open AI, um, which all the more power do it because this adds value to the service while at the same time, possibly putting a, a coffin nail in it because Everybody really should be questioning all of the bullshit that comes out of these AIs. There is a ton of it and you don't know what it is. If you're just doing it for creative purposes, awesome. That's fine. Do it. That's what the tool is there for in my regard. If you're treating it as a subject matter expert for anything and you're not vetting everything, then you are about to meet your end professionally because somebody's going to go, why did you include that in a report? And when you go, well, it was from an AI, you're done. Everybody's going to exactly. question your integrity and your work ethic from that point on. Um, so it's going to be a real shame, but let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in Technology Today. French art group uses brainwaves and AI to recreate landscape landscapes. This is pretty cool. A hypercolor image of a dark hill and lava flow is uh, pretty enough, but it's high tech artificial intelligence origins makes it special. Look at that. Once again, um, AI empowering people to be a creative. That's what I think it it's best at, at least until like the AI suggested it's niche, highly focused. It's a subject matter because it only knows that subject matter. I don't want it to be general because general means that it can make up a bunch of bullshit, but when it's highly focused and it understands a particular field from end to end, then I can ask it as a subject matter expert. You can link a bunch of them together, but you need to be able to choose. I want you to be a subject matter expert in photography. I want you to be a subject matter expert in biology or nuclear physics or chemistry or whatever, but it needs to be siloed away from the poison pills of the rest of society's input, the noise, the garbage. Yeah. You don't want like social media just gibberish or whatever being yeah. fed then we're surprised that the output is gibberish yeah you do not want the website formerly known as twitter feeding into an ai because it's going to be a psychopath not a sociopath so it is the product of brainwaves of one member of french art collective obvious collected in an mri machine at the brain institute of the uh pity salt Salpetriere Hospital. I'm sorry, in in Paris. Yeah, I I gave it my Harvard best. I never went to Harvard. Anyway, I was thinking very hard about a volcano, said Pierre Fautrel, one of the trio. He admits the resulting work was not exactly what he had in mind, but he had kept the basic elements. 
a flaming mountain with flowing lava and a landscape on a light background. So th this is what he thought about. And this is the output of it generated by an AI. I sense bullshit, but okay. Um, so reconstructing imagined images, we've known, quote, we've known for around 10 years that it's possible to reconstruct a viewed image from the activity of the visual cortex, says Elizy Lopez Parsom, a researcher at the Brain Institute, but not an imagined image or image. That's a real challenge. So it took the teams many hours to sort through the data collected in the MRI before obvious fed it into their own AI program, which gives it a specific vibe influenced in part by surrealism. Um, now we have heard, and we've even talked about it a few years ago about how they used an MRI to reconstruct a memory after somebody was questioned. And I basically referred to it as a, the truth machine, which is a book um, that's really neat. Um, and one of the driving forces in my life about technology and its capability to extend um, into the real world in a way to stop things like crime. It's basically, go ahead. Is that by, um, sorry, I'm trying to find who it's by, but I'm getting uh, James Halperin. Yes. Um, so, and I think that it, there's another one that's called Truth Machine, and it's about blockchain and the future of everything. But The Truth Machine is a book by James L. Halperin, which sounds like a medication, but it does actually. <laughs> but, but no um, fault of his own. Yeah. And so some researchers basically reconstructed a memory um, based off of MRI scans. And that is actually. Um, many years ago it was the focus of research that i was doing using fmri technology but the technology just wasn't strong enough now we're on the cusp of high enough um res uh, resolution of fmri technology to detect things like um the the image processing capabilities um and so i thought that that would be great to to talk about this but th this i don't know because i don't know what exactly they all went how they did it and what they did because nobody knows really what these other researchers did at least as far as i know they we don't have the algorithm that was used to reconstruct because there was like some semblance of the memory in the picture that was generated from the scan right. absolutely blew me away um, so I find it really fascinating, um, but I, there has to have been some conscious effort to make this look like this. Um, that's not, to me, that's not even a natural thing. I'd like to know more detail on this. Yeah. So we'll have to do that. Um, we'll noodle around with that and maybe talk about it if it amounts to anything next weekend. Killian Fischow, I think is their name over at techexplore.com. Um, Again, I gave their name of the old Harvard tribe. Anyway, we got to keep going. The next article is over in the mobile channel. Trippy NASA visualization takes you inside a black hole. This will be really quick. This one um, light famously cannot escape the event horizon of a black hole, leaving astrophysicists to theorize and speculate uh, what it's like beyond the limits of human perception. Now, NASA researchers take that theory theorization a step further in the form of an animation that takes you into the black hole. Now, the latest theory that I've heard is that time essentially slows down to the point where you never enter the uh, nobody from the outside ever has the perception of you entering the black hole. So forever you sit there and then the photons that represent you slowly fade away until you are no longer there. But what has happened is you have been pulled into the black hole and spaghettified um, in the process. <coughs> so um, black holes are some of the densest objects in the universe. I don't know. I've seen some people that are pretty <laughs> that are uh, comparable. 
competitive uh, like, for that. <laughs> yeah, really. This isn't a competition, but you're challenging even for you know a black hole. So light cannot escape even their or light cannot escape their event horizons because the hole's gravitational pull is so intense. Um, at the limit of the black hole is its accretion disk, that bright orange yellow swirl of superheated material. Um, I think it keeps on going, but this is actually an image of what is believed to be a, a black hole published in 2019, a supermassive black hole, 6.5 billion times the sun's mass. Um, pretty fascinating. And this is the accretion disk. Wow. That's really cool. Um, and this was discovered because they might actually have it. There was a picture of, um, various stars being pulled around something but there wasn't anything being emitted from that spot and so um, they did another scan of it using different technology and they found that um, so the article says that they simulated two different scenarios one where a camera um, a stand-in for a daring astronaut just misses the event horizon and slingshots back out and one where it crosses the boundary, sealing its fate. Um, but I'm going to let you go and watch this, um, mainly because I don't want to take anything away from this article. I think it's pretty neat. Um, but there, there are things on um, YouTube that talk about it as well. Not particularly this. Um, right, but similar uh concepts concepts about the black hole and um sabine sabina uh, ha, wait what's her last name hassan i don't know how to pronounce her last name i thought it was like yeah. offsetter or something yeah hassan felder sabina hassan felder sorry hassan felder mm -hmm. yeah and veritasium both talk about um these high high-minded uh, physics, so astrophysics. Pretty fascinating. Um, they're, it's all theory and speculation, what it's like on the other side of uh, a black hole and, and what's gonna happen to something. Um, but I find the most compelling one, the fact that you're moving into something so dense that uh, instead of you being seen entering the black hole, basically your photons just freeze and then you slowly fade away like the picture from back to the future and then you no longer exist <laughs> you're basically do you being come converted. off like by pixel or whatever pixel just by like pixel. in the movie yep and then you, you're basically emitted back out as um, radio energy not light it's just oh. Or you end up on the other side of a white hole somewhere else in an alternate universe where aliens greet you and say, oh, you were the first one to do this. Are like, you traveling I, at 88 miles per hour while this is happening? That's right, because you're going to see some sh serious shit. Um, either that or the Libyans coming to get their uh, nuclear um, plutonium. Plutonium. I think. Yeah, the plutonium vials. So the next article is over in Technology Today. CEO of world's biggest ad firm targeted by deepfake scam. The head of the world's largest advertising group was the target of an elaborate deepfake scam that involved an artificial intelligence voice clone. The CEO of WPP, Mark Reed, detailed the attempted fraud in a recent email to leadership warning others in the company to look out for calls claiming to be from top executives fraudsters created a whatsapp account with a publicly available image of reed and used it to set up a microsoft teams meeting that appeared to be with him and other senior wpp executives according to the email that was obtained by um, the guardian apparently so Nick Robbins Early is the author that put this together for theguardian.com. The deck statement says it's an exclusive. Fraudsters impersonated WPP CEO using a fake WhatsApp account, a voice clone, and YouTube footage used in a virtual meet. Um, pretty amazing stuff. The scammers impersonated Reed off camera using the meeting's chat window. The scam, which was unsuccessful, targeted an, an agency leader 
asking them to set up a new business in an attempt to solicit money and personal details. Fortunately, the attackers were not successful. We all need to be vigilant to the techniques that go beyond emails to keep, or sorry, to take advantage of virtual meetings, AI, and deepfakes. This is just fodder for bring you back to the office bullshit. Well, yeah. Yeah. Trust but verify, you know? You don't sit there and go, oh, look, this is out of the blue. I would call somebody up. Well, also, I mean, WhatsApp, I think, is not necessarily known as being like a high secure thing. But like, if you don't use WhatsApp at the office, for instance, yeah, WhatsApp with maybe that? that's a <laughs> clue that something's off. I don't know. So the attempted fraud on WT and WPP likewise appeared to use generative AI for voice cloning, but also included simpler techniques like taking a publicly available image and using it as contact display picture. The attack is representative of the many tools that scammers now have at their disposal to mimic legitimate corporate communications and imitate executives. Absolutely falls under the umbrella of reality hacker. You won't know who to trust. You have to be savvy about these things. You have to click with care. You have to be somewhat understanding that if you don't verify, even an initial communication, even uh, three email lines into it, if you haven't verified something, you can compromise yourself, the other person, the integrity of the enterprise, the stock, um, some external asset, all kinds of stuff, because why? you rushed you you didn't you weren't thoughtful about it and if your business gets pissed off about it then they're a liability to your longevity because at some point they're going to get compromised and you're going to get taken along for the ride or you're going to get thrown under the bus because they didn't accept the liability here they're going to go well you didn't do this or you didn't do that and it'll be a pissing for distance contest in the in the uh, lawsuit um, so just because the email account or just because the account has my photo doesn't mean it's me, Re said in the email. The uh, WPP, a publicly traded company with a market cap of about $11.3 billion, also stated on its website that it's been dealing with fake sites using its brand name and was working with relevant authorities to stop the fraud. Yeah. Unfortunately, the only people that can actually take action against somebody that's falsely representing either a product or a service or a person or a company or whatever are a, a law firm. It, for instance, um, I wanted to spin up a service that could provide a an investigative defense. Basically, if I found a product that was not authorized by the company, I basically go to the company and say, hey, was this verified as authentic of resale selling and use of your name? And when they say no, I can ask the ISP or the eBay or Amazon or whatever uh, service providers to pull it down. Um, but you actually have to have a legal document giving you the right to do that with every single demand. It's kind of like a DMCA, but not uh, not copyright so much as a fraud a claim. This is not correct. Um, and it becomes a bigger issue. So you have to have legal representation. Um, many companies are grappling with the boom of generative AI, pivoting resources toward the technology that while simultaneously facing its potential harms, WPP announced last year that it was partnering with a chip maker, NVIDIA, to create advertisements with generative AI, touting it as a sea change in the industry. In That's 11... very interesting, isn't it? Do you think that caused them to be targeted? I would not be surprised. Yeah. Um, but it's a just pay attention to this, though. The writing on the wall here is that an $11.3 billion company sees AI as a generative AI as powerful enough to replace the content creators, the humans who normally have a much higher hands on uh, hourly rate um, where that margin gets dramatically smaller as more people are brought on board for an advertising campaign. But if they can use generative AI to create a whole bunch of offers that are refined by only a few people that are their determined subject matter experts deserving of $250,000 or more per year. Um, 
you're out of a job. They're going to put the AI in there. It's going to create 10 advertising campaigns that are going to get refined by two people instead of 12. They're going to make money. They're going to get paid their wage, but nowhere in their employment contract is, well, because we're doing 12 people's worth of work, you're not anymore. The AI is. Right, exactly. So it's going to be a tool of wage suppression and concentrated wealth towards the C-suite and stockholders. So good luck, middle class. Let's keep going. Um, the next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. The Met Museum Open AI created an AI chatbot with the persona of a 1930s socialite for a new exhibit. We talked about this briefly last week, but I wanted to talk about it here um, in Reality Hacker. Um, the finale of the Costume Institute's uh, latest fashion exhibit features a wedding dress worn 94 years ago by the New York socialite Natalie Potter and an AI chatbot with her vibe sharing Shibu over at entrepreneur.com put the article together and they have a picture of this thing um, and visitors just had to scan a QR code to talk with Potter chatbot through text um, so it wasn't spoken um, and that was the dress that they wore the AI chatbot answered visitor questions about Potter's wedding, her life, and her dress, all in her persona, based on recordings and documentation of her personality. Um, the I artist, mean, I like this because it's be bringing art to perhaps more tech-savvy generations that maybe want more immersive experiences rather than just going and looking at a dress on display. And I think the really important part, like you said, is that it's going to retain the historical context of that person. And like we were talking last week about um, people passing away and memorials being created, if you can create an AI that has the totality of experience that has been gleaned from various persons input into the AI, it makes it the most personal and if it helps people deal with loss or if it helps people uh, deal with loneliness or something like that, um, then why not, right? If it maintains a language that's lost because the AI has been trained to speak that language, um, I keep talking about like uh, languages in Alaska. Like indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples, yeah, and it gets lost because there isn't any. The children are moving into tech savvy worlds instead of staying um, local and following the old ways. The whole concept of their lifestyle is lost. It's documented in books, it's documented in photos, but it's no longer living. So context is lost. But if you can teach AI um, to be the embodiment of the language, then it could teach somebody um, the language and so on. It could be there uh, in perpetuity, kind of like a museum, but for the entire uh, culture that once existed, I think it, I, I find it absolutely um, fascinating to do something like that. So they say finding a strong use case for AI is important as OpenAI faces lawsuits from creatives and pushback from copyright grounds. Authors like Paul Tremblay and Sarah Silverman have alleged that their books were part of a data set used to train AI without their consent. And artists like Billie Eilish and John Bon Jovi recently signed an open letter. Um, and while I, you know, I've talked about this in the past, so I won't go over it um, again. But I just think that AI and the ability to have it personalized is going to be the the biggest market mover. It's what's going to save AI because a general AI that is a free thinker and all of that kind of stuff, it's going to bring about um, personal rights for quasi sentient or sentient AI. That's, that's going to be an interesting time. A whole massive can of worms. That's why I think OpenAI hasn't announced it. Um, and I think that it actually already is in the hopper. Um, 
but the entire utilitarian side of AI is that it can save the historical context, not as just written down or static recordings, but as a, a somewhat living dynamic entity, keep its core framed around what it's learned so that it always can say what it's been taught but it can actually evolve um, and keep that culture alive, even if it is just a sentient or a semi-sentient AI. Um, I think it's really fascinating. And this was just one of it. Transforming a 94 year old depression era wedding dress into an interactive exhibit at the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Do you think anybody in that era had any idea that this i mean think about it at that time right nobody had computers nobody had uh, it's just it's so fascinating i wonder um and actually if you were around in that time and you were very young maybe you are still around to witness some of it but um you know, I mean, what is that? What is that called? Um, Metro. What is it called? Metropolitan? No, not Metropolitan. Metropolis, right? When was Metropolis made? Nineteen twenty-seven. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. It's a science fiction film directed by Fritz Lang and written by uh, Thea von Harbo in collaboration with Lang. Um, the plot is well, wealthy industrialists and business magnates. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, oh yeah, I guess War of the Worlds and everything was around that time. Like I, I don't know, I guess I wasn't thinking that that would be even in the in the thoughts at that time. Yeah. Yeah, and and so they they create a a machine a person. Dun dun dun. It's pretty fascinating actually. Might have to watch it again. I mean, it's been a long time. Hopefully so, not since it was released. That would be a long time. Uh, you've already said too much. That's it, folks, for Reality Hacker. Um, we always get into the party bus and race back down Main Street and whack that welcome sign. But watch sign. out for that black hole. No, oh, I'm in the black hole. I'm being spaghettified. But that's it. I am Marwat, and all around me is the sentient AI from the future. Not a bot. Good night, hometown citizens. Last time I checked, anyway. Yeah. I know. Okay. See you in a few. Bye-bye, about 15 minutes.